Gray Digger Queen here at the ass end of the night. And these are the times when I have the deepest fright. Right before dawn and the shift has came to its close. No one around and no bodies to drop. Nothing quite to do, but still you can't stop. Just voices of nothing and nothing to do. Things like that would make me go mad and how's about you? Well, children, I must admit, when I hit the road, it does get a little lonesome. And if I was to admit that I had a fear at all, it would probably be being stuck out in the middle of nowhere. Nothing to do, nothing to bound, no one to talk to, no one around. <laughs> Sometimes when you're out there alone by yourself and you find any light, it's enough to guide you through. Even when you know that fire is going to burn you. And what if you were on that lonesome road, children? Would you reach out for another hand to grab? Or would you just die alone? Tonight's tale is called I'm Happy She's Dead by Moncho Shelby. The light had long since fled, and there lay nothing ahead of Ulysses but miles stacked upon endless darkness and open road. Ever so often, a spot of light may wander in the dark. He'd push over to the side of the road as far as he could go and stick out his lone, solitary thumb. He didn't bother to look back. He adopted the mindset of a fisherman setting out a hook. He didn't care who bit, and wasn't confident that any would. He felt as if he had been walking forever in a land that never saw the light of day. The only signs of life were the constant symphony of crickets and the soft rev of passing vehicles. Light slowed and a car eased itself up the road. Ulysses got the message and sprinted towards his respite with urgency, not daring to keep his potential ride waiting. He sidled up to the passenger side. He heard the mechanized sounds of the windows rolling down before he approached. Though darkness cloaked most of the contours of the craft, he made it out to be a Nissan Sentra, either black or dark blue. He lowered his head to the driver's eye line. This was the first hurdle of hitchhiking, deciding at a glance someone's intentions. Could they be trusted to get you a few miles up the road, or were they predators posing as people? Ulysses quickly took the man in and read him. He was average in every way, someone your eye would instinctively roll over as part of the scenery, and to Ulysses, there was something sad about that. Ulysses was in his twenties and in good shape. Though he held his face in a look of caution, there were still glimmers of youthful insolence that the road couldn't beat out of him. Where you going? said the driver with a slight southern accent. Up to the next town for starters. Ulysses said back confidently. He heard the door locks pop, music to his weary feet. He toggled the door handle and placed his overstuffed backpack in between his knees. As soon as the door shut, the car started. The two were enveloped in the darkness, with only the twinkle of wayward reflectors to note their passing. So, what's your name, friend? said the driver. I'm Ulysses. Ulysses? A traveler, huh? Yeah. I guess when you have a name like that, you sort of have to be. Yeah, but why the road, Ulysses? Ulysses noticed that he didn't immediately mention his name after he identified himself, which wasn't necessarily a good or bad thing, though sometimes people did that because they hadn't decided if they were going to tell you their real name and needed a moment to think one up. I sort of had a shit home life, and I figured I'd rather see the road than just live there. The quiet of the highway bled into their conversation. I see, said the driver, as if they shared in a bit of mutual home life drama. Why'd you pick me up? asked Ulysses, more to fill the silence than he cared what the answer may be. I wasn't sure to be honest. It's dark. There's an open highway, nobody watching us but God. I suppose that in the end, I'd rather believe that I'd take in a decent human being than just some drifter. The driver side-eyed Ulysses, wanting to know where he landed on the spectrum. 
I get the fear side of things. I think the same thing when I get in a car. I'm rolling the dice every time I do it myself. That's not really my question though. What got you over the fear? The driver took a moment to think, letting the all-encompassing silence seep into their thoughts. If it's that dangerous, why do you do it? Said the driver. I guess I'm like you. Everybody can't be the worst, right? We can hope. The driver smiled. I'm going to turn on the radio. Is there any type of music you like? I like hip-hop from the 90s and metal. The driver smiled, but only to mask his disinterest. Rap, huh? They never found a swear word they didn't like. Ulysses thought to defend his music, but he didn't. There was no good reason to take a hard line on something that trivial and have to walk 25 miles in the dead of night. Metal. I suppose we can meet in the middle. Looking at your age, Black Sabbath is probably before your time. The driver asked and accused. It is, but I love Black Sabbath. I love old Ozzy and new Ozzy, said Ulysses. Thank God he didn't have to lie. He was a moderate fan of Black Sabbath. Sure, he wasn't buying their music or wearing their merch, but he liked them. He felt they were the forefathers of a lot of new metal, so he at least could respect that. The song Iron Man played and the driver pointed to the stereo. I'm sure you know that, all the Marvel movies coming out. Yeah, I've seen most of them, liked most of them. I don't know what it is, but these new Marvel movies, they don't hit me the same as the old ones. I guess there is only so many times you can take the same formula and make the same thing before people grow a tolerance to it. Like drugs. I guess. The driver added. What's her name? Um, Scarlett Johansson. What do you think of her? Hot. Really hot. Smoking. The driver added, as if dipping his foot into more personal topics. Ulysses navigated these waters carefully, knowing some of these topics could either be a trap to get him down a path he didn't want to go, and a social minefield that could explode in his face. Maybe when they had traveled deeper and farther together, he'd feel okay loosening up and speaking freely. So, Ulysses, what do you do? I mean, when you're not doing this, do you have a trade or a passion? The driver asked. Ulysses thought about it for a good moment. He felt as if he were too young to have a thing. He could draw and liked to write raps, but who the fuck didn't at his age? Everyone wanted to be the gym that Dr. Dre would pick out of the crowd. In his case, he'd be a half-Asian Eminem. I can draw a little bit, but I left home about 16, so I don't know if it could get me anywhere. Whenever I stop doing this, maybe I'll find the time to be good at something. So, when do you intend to stop? Whenever it seems right. Ulysses decided to ask the driver a question. Not his name, not yet, but more a probing question just to see if he could be trusted. So where are you going? Ulysses asked casually as if to make the query seem off the cuff. I'm off to see family in Texas. We have legal matters to discuss. Cool, said Ulysses, who just wanted to make sure he was in fact going somewhere, not cruising the highway for him. It's not really all that cool, to be honest. I have to deal with my wife's family, and I don't particularly like them. Is your wife waiting down there for you? Ulysses asked harmlessly. Nah, she's dead, the driver said as matter-of-factly as if you asked him for the time of day. Ulysses didn't want to say nothing, but then again, he wasn't sure if he wanted to gloss over it either. Oh, he said curiously, but not overly curious. So the driver knew he didn't have to talk about it. Though the driver really did want to talk about it, in fact. Don't get me wrong, she had her good sides and bad sides, but over the years, she just kept rolling out new bad sides. I mean, she was like a Rubik's Cube. Colorful, fun, for a while. But if you don't know the trick to make it work, the shit gets old. You ever have a girl like that, Ulysses? The driver asked without a hint of awkwardness. My only experiences with women were junior year of high school, and I guess a handful on the road. I've never stayed long enough to be bored with a woman, 
Ulysses spoke honestly. Well, shit. You may just be on to something then. Don't get married, son. You'll regret it. Ulysses nodded as if he understood, but just for him to acknowledge he was listening, not necessarily because he was honestly interested in taking his advice. The two drove until they were about seven miles from Austin, Texas. They spoke to each other in sporadic bursts about mundane topics, ranging from the Marvel movies down to what their zombie escape plan was. Eventually, the driver called himself Mark, but Ulysses doubted very highly that was his name. So, what's the darkest thought you ever had? Asked Mark after the two had a half-hour conversation about the Twilight Zone. Ulysses was a bit more comfortable in speaking with the stranger by now after an hour on the road, and he was rested enough that he felt he could walk seven miles easily. Darkest thought? I guess... I thought about pushing someone down a mine shaft. The driver, Mark, raised an eyebrow. That's it, huh? Give me some details, some context. Well, when I was younger, we used to play out on this creek. Me, my two friends, Bernard and Randy. We weren't the biggest kids or the meanest, which of course opened us up to bullies. We were playing in the woods and we found this old mine shaft. Two older boys followed us. They were bullies, of course, but they just smacked us around a bit. Nothing too sinister. This day, Ulysses stopped as if he was having trouble moving forward. Go ahead. It's just you and me, Mark assured him. Well, this particular time, and I have no clue why, they beat us up a little. Nothing that would cause permanent damage, but enough to show they were in charge. So this time, Yasmin, the bully, tells us to take off our clothes. They never did this before. Bernard was so scared he just started doing it. Then they threw his clothes down the deep mine shaft, so deep you couldn't see the bottom. Me and Randy started to do the same. We got to our shirts. Yasmin's buddy Clifford, I don't know, felt some sort of way and pulled his dick out. He told Bernard to suck it. Even his buddy Yasmin was taken aback, but he backed him up. So he tried to force Bernard on his knees. Me and Randy wasn't having that shit. I mean, an ass whooping here and there? Okay, but this shit? Fuck that. They were going to have to beat me to death to get me to do that against my will. I picked up a rock and beamed Clifford's ass. Blood was everywhere. Yasmin figured he'd just kick our asses by himself, like he always did. But this time, we were uniquely motivated to win this fight. We did whatever it took. Biting, kicking, hitting with rocks. We didn't give a fuck how bad they got hurt or how hurt we got. Yasmin had to run after I tripped him and he hit his head. Clifford wasn't out, but he was fucked up. So fucked up, he really couldn't stop us from doing anything to him. Bernard wanted to toss him down the shaft. I was okay with it mostly, but Randy talked us out of it. Ulysses said as if that were the end. Then what? Mark asked. Then nothing. They didn't fuck with us anymore and we never spoke about it. What if he managed to mouthfuck your friend? Do you think you would have done it then? Ulysses thought about it. First to discern what Mark was feeling about this. He was liking this too much. Then to figure what might have happened if he did manage to mouth rape his friend. Mark was so earnest and even about what he said that Ulysses didn't read any further into it. I give it 70-30 odds that we would have done it if Clifford actually did it, said Ulysses. What about you? Ulysses shot back, not because he particularly wanted to know, but he was getting the impression that the stranger really wanted to talk about it, which is why he broached the subject at all. Seven miles until civilization, so he knew the ride was going to be over in 30 minutes or less, and they'd more than likely never see each other again. When I was younger, I used to dream of trapping people I didn't like in a building and burning them alive. Ulysses nodded calmly, but inwardly he was quite ready to leave. I never did it, but I always thought about it, said Mark. What made you think that? Ulysses asked. 
curious if he had a story or an antidote that might offer a bridge for that logic. Mark shrugged with his right shoulder. Don't know. It's always in the back of my mind, though. Ulysses began to see the silhouette of buildings on the horizon of a slowly dawning sun. If push came to shove, he could roll out of the car and make a break for it if they were going in a bad direction. So that was the worst thing you thought to do. What was the worst thing you actually did? Questioned Mark. Ulysses was truly wondering if he should just make something up. But then again, he doubted they'd ever see each other again. So fuck it. Maybe he could use this the same way as Mark did. Ulysses had three things he regretted doing in his life. He could spare one of them for a stranger. In high school, I fucked my best friend's sister, said Ulysses. He never found out about it, or at least I didn't think he did. Why'd you do it? I was young, er, and I just felt the urge. I was 17. I would have fucked a warmed up pie if I could. Okay, that's good. But that's the darkest thing you ever did, said Mark, as if he wasn't impressed. This time, Ulysses didn't ask Mark to elaborate on his transgression, because he didn't want to hear something that he may have to swear to in court. But he got the feeling Mark was going to tell him. He got the impression much of this conversation leading up to this was setting him up to talk to him about his own darkness. I've done wrong here and there, hurt people I felt didn't deserve it, but I think the worst thing I ever did was kill my wife. Ulysses couldn't say that he was surprised at that, seeing how indifferent he was after explaining she was dead. But he didn't tip his hand. It was crucial that he didn't show any judgment, even though he was judging right now. I mean, I killed her, and not only am I showing no remorse, I'm happy she's dead. The cab of the car couldn't have been more quiet. Ulysses even breathed softer as not to add fire to a situation that was already an inferno. Nobody knows I did it. It looked like it was an accident, said Mark smiling. The driver's smile felt darker. Maybe if they did ever find out I can plead self-defense because that bitch was killing me. I couldn't breathe. Ulysses dared to speak. And now you can. Yes, and now I can. Mark added with glee. I switched her pill so that she'd OD. But I did much worse because I'd be damned if she was getting out of here in a beautiful high or some shit. Not after she killed my soul, lesson in me as a man. I choked her a little, then jammed a coat hanger down her throat. If anyone wondered what happened, I could easily say she attempted to induce vomiting. It was the happiest day of my life. Ulysses squirmed like it was his turn to speak in a stage play, but he couldn't find the lines. As far as he was concerned, Mark was a complete psychopath, but a psychopath he was trapped with. Thank you for trusting me with this, Ulysses said as if he had been bestowed a great honor over what he was thinking to say, which was you were a sick fuck. I knew I could, Mark said as if saying what he did out loud somehow unburdened him. The car was still on the expressway, but now they had reached the city. They were driving approximately 75 miles per hour, so if Ulysses jumped out of the car here, there was little chance he'd survive it. Though, by the same note, if he could hold out for a little while longer, he'd have to stop. There was always a reason to stop within the city limits. Ulysses had to engage in conversation. He didn't know if he should address what Mark told him, or if it'd be better to change the subject completely. Anything he chose to do in this instance felt dire. She was killing you though, right? said Ulysses, figuring he'd seem insincere if he acted like it didn't happen. Mark smiled, and to Ulysses, his true nature revealed itself. This was what he was, and he could no longer picture him as the no-faced any man, but truly an agent of chaos. Yeah, she was demeaning. Nothing was good enough for her. She was a shrew. 
Anytime she spoke, she drained a day off my life. I used to be a vigorous, healthy young man, but three years with her, and I look like I'm in my fifties. Well, you don't look that old, said Ulysses. What's that supposed to mean? Mark said defensively. Ulysses inwardly gasped, saying that he wasn't trained by this supposed she-harpy would mean that he couldn't see the reason for why he did it to begin with, which meant he thought he did it just to do it. It means you probably gained some of those years back after it was all said and done, Ulysses replied to correct his misstep. Mark's once neutral face was now a mask of suspicions and barely contained rage. After Ulysses' comment, his gaze returned back to smug confidence. I know, right? It's like I can breathe again. I knew it was a good idea to pick you up. I feel lighter now that I told you. Mark turned off on a ramp into the city. Ulysses breathed slightly easier because he envisioned him having an easier time rolling onto the concrete at lower speeds if he absolutely had to. Mark turned the car down the streets in search of something Ulysses could tell from the eyes, maybe a place he could dump his body for all he knew. I'll tell you another secret, Ulysses. A dark thought. I was thinking of killing you on the road for a moment, but I didn't. After I found out how cool you were. Thanks for that, then, Ulysses said. You're welcomed. The car turned off the main street. Ulysses found he was holding his breath. He released when the car stopped at a gas station. I guess I'll be seeing you, Ulysses. I have to gas up and meet the ex family soon. But thanks for listening and being cool. Ulysses nodded and quickly opened the door. Yeah, thanks for the ride, was all he could manage to say. Mark waved his hand in a fond farewell as Ulysses disappeared into the night, feeling lucky he was moving of his own volition. Five years later, Ulysses had finally stopped moving and decided that his life of adventure was behind him. He had thousands of stories to tell and the scars that prove he had lived as hard as he could for the seven years he'd been traveling place to place. He made a name for himself making videos for YouTube of his adventures. He drew, making beautiful art that was touched by the spark of his adventurous lifestyle and took pictures of the places he'd been. Ulysses had his odyssey, and he was now beginning to start the next chapter of his life. Though he had some money and some fame, and had experienced life in a way that most never would, now that he planned to put it away, he had to deal with the mundane things that having an ordinary life entailed. Getting a house or apartment, building your credit, getting driver's licenses. He had money, more or less, but much of it was just sitting in a bank account untouched because of the minimal life he had lived up until this point. He settled in and became a member of a community full of neighbors, haunts, and dives. Ulysses was starting to become familiar, knowing people and letting people know him. Learning to cook was a slow process that he was proud to say he was learning. On a mundane excursion to the grocery store, he came across a spectacular feat of coincidence. He was getting checked out and he needed to buy brandy to marinate his chicken in, but the cashier wasn't 21 years old. In these cases, an older person was needed to come down and make the swipe. It wasn't anything to it. But who but Mark came from the back of the store and swiped the bottle. Ulysses looked the man dead in his face and could swear it was him, but the man didn't show even the slightest glimmer of recognition. Ulysses looked down at the man's name tag and it was Ron. Of course this didn't prove anything because he assumed he didn't tell him his real name anyways. Mark, or Ron, as was his real name, passed down onto the sales floor, swiped the bottle, and just walked away. He didn't look at Ulysses or regard him. Ulysses smiled and figured it must have been a coincidence, so he didn't say anything or tip his hand bringing up anything that didn't need be brought up. He didn't give it another thought and just decided it best to continue living his life. 
Ulysses focused all his attention on strengthening the pillars of normality that became the foundation of his life. He went back to the grocery store, not expecting or attempting to encounter Mark or Ron, if that was in fact his real name, or if that was in fact the person he assumed it was. After a month of frequent trips, Ulysses hadn't thought about it at all until he came up again. He had bought the wrong beans for his beef burritos and decided to go to customer services to see about a refund. There was Ron again who waved him forward with no fanfare when it was his turn. What seems to be the problem, sir? Said Ron. I was looking for pinto beans, but I got black beans. I was looking for a refund, Ulysses said. Ron began typing something on the computer. He took the can and scanned it, but in the moment that the two found they had awkward empty space, Ron felt the need to fill it with something. The wife got you running errands, he said offhandedly. I'm not married, said Ulysses. Can't live with him, can't kill him, Ron said with a slight chuckle to himself as if it were his own little inside joke. Ulysses smiled, but it was something in his voice that chilled him, rekindling his suspicion. When he didn't laugh, Ron looked at the card he paid with more closely. Ulysses, a traveler. Ron stopped himself short, as if a distant thought were clearing itself up and coming in from the fog of his memory. His eyes slowly flared with recognition. They locked eyes, both knowing, both letting it go unsaid. The two familiar strangers parted without another word. Ulysses didn't sleep well that night, when he was dealing with an anonymous psychopath was one thing, but to have to deal with a psychopath embedded in his community was a different thing. What was his obligation to humanity here? Should he expose it? Could he expose it? Even though he told him, without proof it wasn't something he could just accuse him of. Even if he did in fact have a dead wife. Ulysses let his fingers do the walking to investigate this. Ron, the grocer, for the better part of two hours. Looking into his history, he did have a wife that died from an accidental overdose. He had soon been awarded a good chunk of money from her death, and with what he had, he must have opened a grocery store. He wasn't sure about that last bit, but what he couldn't figure, he had to fill in the blanks with. So it was true, he had gotten a confession from his own mouth, though he didn't know how this would hold up in court. A dark thought crossed his mind. He had been on the road for many years, and in that time he got more than a few propositions to murder people. He had never taken any of them, but the closest he had ever came was when someone he hitched with robbed a gas station and shot a clerk. He had never knew if that clerk actually died or not, but it had always been something that weighed on his mind. The driver just did his dirt and decided to pull him into his bullshit. What if he just did what so many strangers asked him to do? He could find this Ron character, go to his house, and just knife him to death. He didn't own a gun, not particularly because he had any hang-ups about them. It was just something he hadn't got around to doing since he put down roots. Ulysses stopped to think about it long and honestly. Let's say he did kill his wife. It would have been preferable if he paid for his crime, but the bigger question was, did he think he would do it again? If he had done a bad thing, one bad thing, and never intended to do another, did he need to be the one to take action? Ulysses thought that maybe he didn't need to, but there was one hiccup in this otherwise sound logic. He was happy to see her dead and was not remorseful. Not only did he not care, he fantasized about killing other people. If he was to kill him, maybe the world would be better off. Ulysses hopped from bed with a renewed purpose. He made a trek down to the basement, to his workshop. He pulled the string on a singular swinging light bulb and gazed upon his wall of murder implements, which were garden tools and things that he had used for home improvement. The nail gun was weak but it potentially could kill someone. The hammer? Hmm, he wasn't sure about the hammer. It was less blood, potentially, but the idea of caving in a skull making it soft mush felt like an advanced weapon that needed a certain level of callousness. 
though any of them had the potential not to outright kill, seeing that that was not their true purpose. He collected a tangle of nylon ropes, some garbage bags, a crowbar, and the knife that he kept with him throughout the entirety of his vagrancy. He was going to have to stop by the Home Depot and get more things, like maybe bleach and plastic gloves. Ulysses managed to find Ron's house through his internet search, so after his little pit stop, he was off to scope the house at least, even if he hadn't yet built the nerve to do the deed. He trekked down the aisles of the hardware store, attempting to think of anything he could that may aid him in killing and getting away with it. While most times when a murderer did get caught, it was because that person had some sort of connection to the victim, but in his case, he couldn't believe that any investigator was savvy enough to put this together. If it took him several weeks to even remember he even rolled with a man five years ago once, there was no way someone from the outside could ever piece that information together. Ulysses stood in the checkout line. As he slowly craned his neck to look to his right, he saw Ron in a line adjacent to him. He did a double take and pretended not to notice, but his initial reaction was so big he doubted that he could maintain that level of anonymity. He attempted to steal glances. He noticed Ron stealing glances back his way. It was the equivalent of the adult version of red light, green light. He glanced down at his cart, and oddly enough, the things in it mirrored his own. Nylon rope, plastic bags, plastic gloves, bleach. It could have in fact been a coincidence, but something about the timing of it didn't let him believe it. They were on track to leave the store relatively about the same time if both lines moved at a steady clip and Ulysses was already gripped with the tingles of awkward energy in the air. Both of them had to suspect the other's intention, but neither one of them could say. If they managed to leave at the same time, it would be awkward if they left together and didn't speak seeing they had been seeing each other at the grocery store for several weeks. And in fact, had a conversation this very day. Ulysses was thinking to call the whole thing off, but seeing what Ron had gotten for himself, he sure didn't seem as if he were going to share that sentiment. So in a way, there was no backing out of this. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen soon, whether he was on top of it or let it happen. The two men tried very hard to stall asking the cashier questions, but that only assured that both of them would expend the same amount of time. Ulysses put his bags in the cart and decided to try to speed up, perhaps beating Ron to the door so they would never make eye contact, but as he got to the door, a security guard that was tasked with checking receipts had to stop and look through an old woman's bags. He didn't know what he found, maybe it was something she forgot to scan. It didn't matter. All that actually mattered was that Ron, despite moving as slow as humanly possible, had no excuse not to push his cart up behind Ulysses. He felt the eyes of a killer boring down on his neck as if burning a hole into it. The two men awkwardly pushed their carts in the desolate parking lot. They both tried to wheel slower than the other hoping to get the safer view from behind. Ulysses pretended to tie his shoes so that Ron would pass him and he could gain the advantage, but Ron slowly put his card up, even before he made it to his car to slow himself down and keep the upper hand. When Ulysses stood up, he was startled by the angry baying of a car horn. He realized that he was in the middle of the road. Ron and Ulysses both had to address the sharp, ear-piercing shriek of the horn. The two men locked eyes. At this moment, they were either going to acknowledge each other or they weren't. The pause lasted upwards of five seconds, which was an eternity for a chance encounter with strangers. The two men held their neutral expressions in a game of emotional chicken. Ulysses smiled slowly, as if he were coming to the realization that he noticed Ron. Oh hey, you're from the grocery store. Ulysses said with a voice that was overly enthusiastic for greeting a stranger he barely knew. Yeah, yeah, black beans, said Ron. We just missed the store closing, said Ulysses who grabbed at absolutely anything to say. Yeah, seems like, Ron shot back. What brings you out? Ron chuckled a bit as if this dance of civility was a bit funny to him. 
but he widened his smile and played along. Same as you, looks like, he said, glancing into Ulysses' cart. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So what are you working on? Oh, just have a painting project I need to get done. Ulysses shook his head and internally kicked himself for not thinking of that himself. Yeah, me too. I'm sort of new to the area, so you know. Oh, really? How long have you been here? Three months or so. What brought you? Ron asked quickly to see if he'd given off-the-cuff reaction. My art career took off, and it seemed like a nice, quiet place. Art, you say? Ron parroted as if it were further confirmation of Ulysses' identity. Yeah, you? I don't know, about five years or so. What brought you down? Well, my wife died. I just needed a change of venue, said Ron, who was, as of now, all but telling Ulysses he knew that he knew. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Nah, nah, it's okay. We didn't get along. I know it's horrible to say, but it all sort of worked out for me in the long run. Are you married now? Actually, I am. I suppose I just don't learn. Well, you have a second chance. What are the odds things will turn out the same way? You can't live your life fearing the consequences. Do you really believe that? Said Ron, who seemed as if that was actually a real question, not a carefully laid comment filled with devil meaning and innuendo. I think I do, said Ulysses. Ron took a suspicious glance around at the slowly waning parking lot. There were only a few cars still there as it was, and people came out in trickles. Ron extended his hand to shake. I'm Ron. Ulysses looked at Ron's hand as if it were poison, but the idea of being rude outweighed his caution. The ex-drifter moved in closer and reached for Ron's hand. As soon as he did, Ron grabbed Ulysses quickly with one hand and pulled him in extremely close and extremely fast, sinking in his gut a hidden blade. He hit him with a serpent strike that was just concealed enough that maybe someone watching a camera may not notice. And if he were lucky, he died driving himself to the hospital and crashed, perhaps covering the attack completely. Ron took what Ulysses said to heart. You couldn't live your life in constant fear of consequence. Ulysses slumped down and fell over. He was too weak to instantly fight back and he struggled to stay on his feet. He took awkward, unsure steps, not knowing which one would be his last. He watched Ron walk casually to his car as if nothing happened. He wasn't exactly sure what his end goal was, but he was not concerned with his motivations and methods when more of his blood was on the ground than in his body. He reached for his car door with red stained hands and realized in this moment he could no longer stay here. Try as he may, try as he might, something like this always found him. He looked to Ron, who was watching him in his white Dodge caravan. It reminded him of a predator in the wild that hamstrung you, then watched you bleed out, so there would be no need for a fight. Ulysses got into his car and turned the key with blood-slicked hands. He threw the vehicle into reverse and peeled out. He slammed into Ron's minivan and then stepped out of his Ford Escape. He walked with an amazing amount of calm. Ron, however, rolled out of the driver's seat and onto the concrete. I wanted to make this work, said Ulysses, whose voice became deeper and demonic. With each approaching step, his body began to reshape, becoming bigger, becoming something that was far from human. His form swelled so massively that he tore out of his clothes. Spikes and bones that had no business for being pushed itself from his skin. When Ulysses stood over Ron, he was huge and hulking. Steam oozed from his body. You destroyed your immortal life, and that's all I ever wanted, said Ulysses in a bass-filled voice that boomed. Ulysses hit Ron, who cowered in his shadow once and only once. When the blow fell, Ron's neck cracked and the back of his head slammed unnaturally into his shoulder blade. The man slumped over like a broken doll. I wanted to live. This time, I wanted to live. 
Ulysses yelled up into the vastness of the sky as if lamenting to an unseen entity. With one massive leap, he bounded into the heavens, and reptilian wings sprouted from his back, guiding his ascent. Two killers, titans of industry, clashing in a battle in a grocery store. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> If you ever find yourself in oblivion, and believe me, you will, just reach your hand up from that grave, and the grave digger queen will be there. I'm always there. Night, children. <laughs>